And we are live. Thank you, everybody who is joining us today, watching another exciting episode of the Zenthanol IPM series. Uh, we have the IPM specialist with us today. He's also a contributor to Skunk Magazine, and he is a person that you can find all over the internet dispensing this excellent information. But we've got him again right here today. So let me turn this over to you, Matthew Gates. What are we going to be talking about today? Hey Chad, today we're going to be talking about the two spot spider mite Tetranicus urtiki. Oh, good stuff. No, the spider mite, man, that is something that you hear time and time again, whether it's an experienced grower, a lot of times it's a new grower. Uh, so, this is a great topic to get into, and you've arranged an awesome presentation. So, let me bring that up and uh, let you get started. Thanks very much. Yep. Yeah. So today we're going to be talking about the two-spot spider mite, Tetranicus urtiki. We're going to be talking, of course, about things like prevention, mitigation, treatment, uh, but we'll also spend a healthy amount of time on its biology and behavior because there's a fascinating array of information about it, and it can help. It'll help you understand um, how to defeat the spider mite by understanding its weaknesses and strengths and its life stages and things like that, you can detect it and you'll also be able to understand things like how advanced a colony is or something like this. And if you need extra information, I have a YouTube channel, Zenthanol. I also take professional inquiries at my website, zenthanol.com. But there's three videos here on the right. Uh, Tetranagus urtiki, my pest primer. Also identification of Tetranagus urtiki and Tetranax Urtiki Physiology and General Knowledge, which some of the information we talk about uh, is drawn from these videos and the sources in them. At the same time, you can see on the left here what happens when uh, the spider mite colonies get quite severe. Uh, you have this webbing that occurs and spider mites get their name because they are able to fasten silk and that plays a large role in their, um, their colony behavior and also their ability to travel. A little bit about myself though, I have been in the IPM space for 12 years now, and mostly it's been with cannabis, but I've also worked with cut flowers. Uh, when I spent time in, in the People's Republic of China, I worked with tea growers, and I've also worked in roses and lilies and peppers and other vegetable crops as well. I have an educational YouTube channel called Xenthanol, and I also can be found on Instagram and Twitter at Sync Angel. And I have a couple of chapters I've written about pests in cannabis specifically, which I'm pretty proud of. One is called Integrated Pest Management Against Arthropod Pests of Cannabis Sativa in the United States of America. And the other one is called Viral Diseases of Hemp, Cannabis Sativa. And uh, I was also broadcast a few years ago on a Japanese television network about uh, cannabis in California, which was kind of interesting. So a little bit of history. I always talk about the evolution and physiology of the pests that we deal with when it's even possible, but I'll only go over very briefly about this. Um, many people are vaguely aware that mites are not really insects, but they might not know exactly what they are. And I'm here to tell you that they are arachnids. So not just spiders are arachnids, but a large group of organisms are arachnids. And they're part of this larger group called the chelicerates. And all of those Chelicerata, as you can see in this phylogenetic tree, uh, descend from a common ancestor from a very long time ago, more than 500 million years ago in molecular clock estimations, and also with some fossil uh, history thrown in there for, um, for uh, calibration. And you can see there are things like the Arrhenii, which are the spiders, of course. You've got scorpions, the scorpiones, the pseudoscorpiones, right? And then you've got the Acariformes, which is the group of mites. Akari means mite, and of course, form is form. So these are the mite formed mites, uh, aside from the par parasitiformes, which are the parasite formed mites. Um, and those are all in the group Akari. So our target here is Tetranagus urtiki, which is incredibly common. And it is a relatively recent uh, development when we look at the entire history up here. Um, 
but the family Titronikidae that the spider mites all are a part of has probably been here for about since the Cretaceous period, or maybe they started to diverse around that, diversify around that time. So they've been feeding on plants for quite a long period of time, and through this they've had quite a bit of evolutionary adaptation. Two-spot spider mites can look um, variable. There are many ways that a two-spot spider mite can look, and there are also other spider mites that look very much like the two-spot spider mite. So that introduces a lot of confusion when it comes to identification in the field. Technically speaking, you might not actually know for sure that a mite that you're dealing with is the two-spot spider mite, even if it looks pretty much identical. And part of that reason is, of course, these different color morphs, like a green color morph or a red color morph. A long time ago, um, not that long ago, but there, there's always been this contention about a species called Titronica cinnabarinus, cinnabar like the color red. And for a long time, people were not totally sure if this particular species was synonymous with Tetranicus urtici or another Tetranicid, or was it something separate? And in breeding programs, they were able to tell that they could interbreed, which is usually uh, not good if you're trying to separate the species. Um, and also they were able to tell that they were quite similar uh, genomically. And now we know that they're just the red form. And I've seen people parrot this information, this um, outmoded information um, in some, some spaces. So I want to clear that up a little bit in case you see the word Tetranica cinnabarinus in research or in products, um, they're talking about the same organism. Uh, but generally speaking, the bottom left here, you can see they have eight legs, like uh, most ar arachnids have as adults. And they have this sort of ovoid sort of body, which is spiked with a bunch of stiff hairs called CD. They are typically sedentary when they're on plant tissue and they're feeding, but they can actually move kind of fast uh, if you motivate them to do so by disturbing them in some way. Um, you can also see that they move very fast on their own silk webbing, uh, which is pretty alarming if you've ever seen that. And on the right, you can see various phenotypes of um, the spider mite. Again, you've got green forms and red forms. We've got some that are the result of starvation. Others are the result of what we call diapause, which we'll get into later. It's like hibernation. And you can also even see some examples of what spider mite eggs look like at the bottom, which is basically a clear, perfect orb that darkens in coloration as it gets uh, more mature. Some quick facts about the two spotted spider mites biology and bionomics, which is like its life stage and other sort of life history. Um, we know it from a description that we first have from Carl Ludwig Koch in 1836, which is 186 years ago on the singing nettle plant, Urtica dioica, which is why it's pronounced, well, urtici or urtici, like to irritate. That is what that means, urtica in Latin. So it's tetranicus, which means four clawed, a nike or a nicus is like their last tarsal um, structure, but you don't have to know about that. That's what the genus name means. And then the species epithet is urtici, probably based on its stinging nettle um, description in the beginning. That's very common uh, to name something after which you first find it on or something that you associate with commonly. But sometimes our primary uh, documentation um, doesn't belie the, the entirety of its physiology because we know very well that the two spot spider mite is documented on over 1,100 species of plants, up to 4,000 in some documentations, which is possibly the widest diet of any herbivore I've seen in certain research. And you can tell, for those who aren't familiar with my IPM series so far, I like to put down the references for the statements that I make so that you can do further reading. And here I have uh, referenced that claim from Spider Mites Web, a comprehensive database for the Tetranicidae. From 2019. We also know that its genome is very small for my friends who are familiar with these concepts and ideas. It's only got about 90 megabase pairs, which is actually really, really small. Um, nucleobases are those things that are like those three letters that create amino acids like ATG and TAA and GTA and that sort of a thing. Those are nucleobases and those are the pairs of them and they've only got uh, about 90 million, uh, which is kind of small because humans have about 6.2 uh, 
gigabase pairs. They have 6,200 megabase pairs. And cannabis has only about 808 uh, mega, megabase pairs, according to the research that I found on the subject. So as you can see, it's, it's very, very much smaller than its host and also us. And the time from egg to adult is about seven to eight days at optimal temperatures, which is about 27 to 32 degrees Celsius in certain research reports. But again, this very varies heavily with temperature and humidity and other sorts of metrics. But temperature is usually the biggest and most important one. There's some extra data for you, for those who are interested. Um, life table parameters of Tetranagus urtici on different bean varieties. This was published in 2015. And you can see here um, that the life stage that Tetranagus urtici spends the most time in is actually the egg stage, which is why predators that go after the egg stage are really important. They're not uh, a complete breakfast of biocontrols that you want to apply necessarily, but things that attack the eggs that are produced so commonly and so um, quickly are something that you really want to pay attention to. Like, for example, the persimilis mite is very well known for this. They pretty much take about a day to go through all these various stages of development, the larva, the proto-nymph, the deuterochrysalis, the deuteronymph. So they have like a chrysalis stage between each nymph stage. And then eventually they have the adult. And as you can see, they spent about 10 days to do so. Um, the two-spot spider mite egg laying capacity is pretty robust. Um, they can produce anywhere between 50 to 100 eggs as females. 80% of those can be females in many tests. This has been what we have found. And uh, they last about 28 days. They start to die around a month after they are born. And depending on the, the cultivar of plants, researchers have shown that uh, we can see that there's a difference between the egg laying ability of a population. And it might not seem like a difference of four to six eggs per female per day is extensive. But when we're talking about you know, hundreds, triple digit numbers, and then also of each particular adult, if you have a colony of 100, that's a lot of eggs. And the difference is actually pretty significant. And this is mediated by the suitability of the host. So they can also disperse over wind. Um, silk webbing helps them a little bit to get caught by things like other branches, um, other low-hanging plants around them, short distances and things like this. But actually, most of the time when they're carried over wind, they do so without any silk at all. And you can kind of see in these videos what they look like on the silk for those who don't know. You can also see a couple of persimilis mites um, very quickly. It's kind of hard to see it in this video, but luckily you have the ability to pause and to come back to this video later or rewatch it uh, in order to kind of see what we're dealing with here. But you can see a lot of these mites are just strewn about on the webbing, probably producing a lot of eggs, females producing pheromones and laying it on the silk in order to aggregate more females and males. You can also see that um, they will tend to ball quite a bit up on the most vertical sort of edge of a plant. And again, that helps them sort of disperse. Um, here you can see their dispersal movement. Uh, this research was made quite a while ago in 2008. Um, and it's a, it's a response to a lot of different things, usually host senescence. So the host plant literally maturing or dying um, is usually pretty common. They haven't eaten in a long time, their age, and also their reproductive status. People are um, surprised to find out that actually Phytocilis persimilis, the persimilis mite, also uh, is windborne under certain circumstances. I have here that uh, from this research report, aerodynamic advantages of upside down takeoff for aerial dispersal and Tetranicus spider mites. That takeoff is likely under the control of the mites as a behavioral response to biological and meteorological conditions like the climate. Mites' age and density, host quality, and mating history significantly influence the incidence of aerial takeoff behavior. Persimilis, a phytocyan mite that is a highly specialized predator of spider mites, controls aerial takeoff in response to leaf damage caused by tetranic surtiki. 
Also, I thought it'd be interesting to go over how they see because um, an experience that I had growing with Gerber growers um, close to a decade ago was that um, the growers were very sure that the spider mite was attracted to certain plants that they had because of their color. These were um, Gerber daisies and they had many different colors, violets and reds and yellows. Um, and certain colors were more profitable, more important than others. And uh, I proposed that actually the reason why these plants were getting colonized was not because of light or color detection, but because um, they were close to the entrance, which is way easier to get something from the external area. Um, they didn't find that very convincing until I showed them this research about how they see. So um, it turns out that they have what's called positive phototaxy, which is the attraction to a light um, at about 375 nanometers, which is actually lower than what is perceptible by humans, generally speaking, pretty much always um, unaided. And this is like closer to the ultraviolet spectrum. Um, whereas they are negatively phototaxic, meaning that they are repelled by colors in the 700 nanometer range or light range, I should say, that spectrum is associated with the color red, which was the color of the flowers we were talking about. And we get what's called photokinesis at about 525 nanometer light, which is like a green color, which kind of makes sense, right? That they would be activated by the perception of the green color. I can't think of any of the green things that they would be curious about, right? But then this was also interesting that I came across. And one of the reasons why I love to do these presentations is that it causes me to hone my own skills, to look at research that I already looked at and am aware of, but also new research that's come out in various subjects. And here we see that yellow light reduced the egg laying of Tetranicus females, which is really interesting. Um, and I don't really have a, I don't really know for what reason, and the researchers certainly couldn't tell exactly why this was. Meanwhile, blue light was apparently much more stimulatory. And I think the reason for this research was to find uh, the right environment in order to produce more mites for research. Um, and so this would be very useful to know if you're trying to produce a, quite a bit of them to test something like maybe some sort of pesticide or or just trying to have them as a culture for more research. Spider mites are, um, they're very complicated. They have an incredibly good physiology for plant defenses and detoxification. And they're my favorite model organism to talk about these sorts of things because of this robustness. And their ability to colonize your cannabis plants is going to be based on two things. Primarily, it's going to be based on what we would call host adaptation status and also sort of the plant defenses, specifically like the jesmonic acid pathway signaling processes in the plant, which many plants have conserved, but various plants have different unique properties um, in addition to that. And I want to go over again that here, resistance is the capacity for a plant to grow unhindered by, in this case, spider mite colonization is not immunity, which is the capacity for a plant to reject spider mite colonization. I go on to here say that genetic resistance is conferred by directly damaging plant mite parasite or augmenting other physiological factors like stressors. Plants are under their own basic metabolic stressors. They can be under light, temperature, humidity, uh, irrigation stressors. These are all things that factor in microbiome also factors in quite a bit. There are other factors to consider, certainly. But uh, a lot of this happens at a genetic level. And you can see in the diagram on the right, sort of a depiction here. Uh, one of my favorite research reports about two spot spider mites capabilities is this one. So I'm going to name drop it. It's called Plant Herbivore Interactions, a case of an extreme generalist, the two spot spider mite. And this was published in 2017. I like to call it the poison drinker. Two spotted spider mites known on 4,000 plant species across 140 plant families, which is insane, and has the highest incidence of pesticide resistance of arthropods documented, especially pesticides that you would want to use in cannabis either, but that just speaks to its abilities. You have various things for those who are biochemists in the audience. They have things like cysteine peptidases, which are 
for proteolytic digestion, like protein digestion. They have these cytochrome P450 enzymes for detoxification. They have about 86 genes in total. We as humans have about 57, according to the research that I found, which is pretty amazing. In fact, it is, in fact, cytochrome P450 uh, that is responsible for a lot of the degradation and breakdowns of pharmaceuticals that we take and also cannabinoids for that matter. In fact, certain cannabinoids like cannabidiol or CBD can interfere with our P450 enzyme um, productivity. So if you take something like a blood thinner, like uh, warfarin or kudamin, um, taking CBD and other cannabinoids as well can have an interfering effect that might be problematic sometimes. So that's the same kind of enzyme. There's also carboxyl or cholinesterases, which are also for detoxification. They have glutathione sulfur transferases, also for detoxification. They have 12 what are called mu types, which are very rare. The paper actually says they are not found in anything else except for vertebrates, except in this case with spider mites, which is insane. But I wanted to say something more conservative here that is a rare example outside of vertebrates. They have these things called ATP binding cassettes, which are for detox or efflux. These are massively more concentrated in spider mites than in all other arthropods. That includes insects and mites that have been documented. And what this does is allow them to quickly move toxins uh, from their midgut or from their foregut into their midgut and hindgut in order for them to quickly excrete them and get rid of them and uh, submit them to more detox detoxification methods. They also have these two things at the bottom, which are really fascinating. They're both sets of genes that are the result of horizontal gene transfer from an incredibly ancient example before insects and mites even uh, existed and speciated. So we're talking many hundreds of millions of years ago. They have one, which is the intradial ring cleavage dioxygenases, 16 of those in total, which are from bacteria. And usually bacteria only have one to seven. So to have 16 in one organism is again, very amazing. They also have carotenoid biosynthesis genes and they use this for diapause. This is very important for overwintering of females and this protects them from things like UV light, but also it helps with detoxification. And this is again from a fungal horizontal gene transfer event. So pretty, pretty interesting. And then just to give you an interesting diagram to see, on the right, you have this diagram. On the top, you have examples of different genes that are upregulated on different plants. So like tomato versus thale cress or uh, uh, aridopsis, which a lot of people know is a model plant in research. Also on beans, um, you can see that there is quite a difference. And depending on the host, spider mice were, were found to have a very different upregulation or downregulation of genes, which is, again, uh, really something that speaks to their adaptability. When spider mites feed on a plant, immune suppression and detoxification factors are stimulated and produced in, con in context of the specific plant defenses that are encountered. And I, I pose this question. I'm curious what people in the audience are wondering here. Um, because when we talk about adaptation, how long has this adaptation really been occurring? And for cultivators, this is very important, especially for people trying to breed resistance or simply trying to keep their plants healthy. How many consecutive or overlapping generations have developed on cannabis globally in the past 20 or 60 years, not even counting anything past that? Possibly thousands in cultivation, discounting feral and wild populations of cannabis in Eurasia, in North America and South America and elsewhere in the world. And then I go over how they feed. They don't really feed like aphids do, uh, which is another thing that allows them to be so successful. They are able to bypass a lot of plant defenses because they feed mainly on leaves by piercing individual cells. Uh, whereas aphids will feed on the phloem sap and try to get into the sea of elements. These ones are not interested in this. They mostly just eat the cell contents, a lot of it being chlorophyll. They insert a stylet between epidermal cells, or they just bypass it by feeding through the stomata, which is kind of uh, funny to think about. 
they inject a saliva and they pre-digest the cell content and then suppress defenses and do things like this. And then they suck up the pre-digested uh, cell content. That's why when you've seen spider mite damage, they have that sort of stippling sort of thing that occurs. And that's individual cells in aggregate that have been basically sucked dry. Um, so chlorophyll is lost, photosynthetic rate is decreased, and chlorotic lesions form. Those are the kinds of symptoms that you would be looking for. And I want to go over here that um, there are defenses that plants have towards spider mites, and many of them are also generalizable to cannabis. So, for example, non-glandular trichomes will physically disrupt the two-spot spider mite in its feeding and movement. You can kind of think of them as like, kind of like, um, like how it would be difficult for you to move through a dense forest with a lot of underbrush and knotty roots and things like that that would trip you up and slow you down and cause you to exert a lot more energy uh, to get to where you're trying to go. And when you're a small little organism, that's crucial, critical energy that you would try that you would try to use for other things. And it actually adds up quite a bit, believe it or not, even if it's a sublethal sort of thing. They also have um, plants have epi epicuticular wax, which physically disrupts feeding. But it's been found in research that taking away the wax can actually make plants more resistant than leaving the wax on in certain cases. And this is actually not attributed to pests, but actually their stress response to water retention. And that perhaps causes immune responses that also have an overlapping effect with resistance with the mice. So that's something you would intuitively think to be the case, but again, that's why this research can be kind of helpful. And also here, which is the reason why I bring up the generations problem is that in research with tomatoes from non-adapted strains to adapted strains, it only took about 30 generations to be that were produced um, to have an adapted strain that was very, very easy to uh, feed and reproduce on tomato. So 30 generations can be produced in three to five cannabis growing seasons. If we assume that the mean generation time is about 18 days of first spider mites and one season is about maybe 30 weeks, it depends. Um, especially again, if they're establishing in feral populations where the plant isn't going to be harvested, the plant might be able to grow for even longer periods of time and eke out in existence. And over that period of time, I believe that spider mites, oftentimes the ones that we're dealing with, have become pretty familiar and uh, adapted to the cannabis physiology, which makes our jobs as cultivators much more difficult. If you ever wanted to know what a spider mite looks like at a kind of at a cross section, a sagittal cut, this is what they look like. That uh, that area that's titled CNM is a basically their brain essentially, although it is uh, not nearly the sort of um, put together to call it something like that. I think they use yeah they use the word central nervous mass so. There you kind of go. And this is kind of a helpful diagram that shows how spider mite feeding works and how they're able to do what they do. Very briefly, um, they when spider mites feed, even though they have all these great advantages, eventually some of these compounds do get into cells and trigger a response. Damp means damage associated molecular pattern. So like a little molecule or some aspect of their physiology that the plants um, have receptors for. In fact, we have receptors for uh, mosquito saliva, for example. So when mosquitoes bite our skin and they um, produce saliva, our bodies have a, have a um, specialized receptor for that kind of saliva and they that triggers an immune response. The same thing happens in plants. And one of two things can happen. Either the plant will have a um, way to deal with the effectors that suppress immune signaling in the plant, or they won't. And if they don't, then they're very susceptible to the spider mite. It doesn't mean that they're going to die, but it means that the spider mite can exist pretty comfortably on the plant. If they do have a robust way of defeating even these suppressive forces, then you might get some level of resistance. And even though the spider mites can exist on the plant, the plant will still be able to survive and um, be able to produce and yield pretty similarly than it would without. And that's kind of the goal for a lot of resistance breeding. And uh, yeah, so this is a diagram of what certain aspects of spider mite bodies sort of look like and how they feed. 
Um, as you can see, the stylet is moving through the epidermis into a cell that is sucking the mesophyll out of, or I'm sorry, yeah, the cell contents. Um, you can see their fecal matter, strands of silk, and even how the eggs look kind of at this scale. And on the right, we have a scanning electron microscope graph of a spider mite and its stylet moving into the cells, which is pretty cool. This is just more examples of how they're able to do what they do. Um, you can see the tomato non-adapted mites versus the tomato adapted mites in these two diagrams have a very different sort of immunological response and genetic response. And so in the non-adapted ones, they had these sort of changes um, in the uh, upregulation of the mites. Whereas on the right side with the adaptation, they, uh, they had more genes that were turned on and that's what those sort of blue colors are. And uh, did I forget anything else? No, I don't think so. And then this is more of that. The only thing I wanna say here, I talked about it a bit in the first episode uh, where we talked about IPM and what is a pest and what makes a pest a pest. And I gave this example that over time, especially spider mites, they have this uh, tendency where in which they will, um, first they'll have strategies that, de that uh, suppress the immune response in plants that they feed on. And that's really useful because then you can kind of reproduce very quickly and you don't have to worry about these toxins. But over time, a lot of times they adapt to actually elicit an immune response in their plant host, which is kind of counterintuitive. But the reason for this is actually because their detoxification capability is so great that it's better for them to just tank the uh, toxins and other immune responses that the plant can produce and even interfere with the immune response by upregulating many different aspects of the immune response in plants, different signals and that kind of a thing. And this actually has negative effect on the host, but also on other parasites, uh, other insects and mites and fungi and bacteria that are trying to parasitize their host. So it's kind of a way for them to actually help the plant fight off other things, but not themselves. Um, so I think that's kind of interesting. And you can defeat this pretty readily by introducing not just chemistries into your integrated pest management, but also biocontrols and other disruptive agents. How dedicated am I to talking to you about the physiology of the spider mite? Pretty dedicated. Here's a picture of what I was describing earlier. Essentially, um, spider mites have this ability to uh, kind of have a filter. The compounds and other substances that they put into their bodies can be kind of filtered between low molecular weight and high molecular weight uh, substances. The high molecular weight substances are probably things like proteins and carbohydrates and uh, byproducts from the chlorophyll pre-digestion and that sort of a thing. And they're gonna digest that. Most of that's actually gonna go to the production of eggs and silk in female uh, spider mites. Whereas the blue that you're seeing in some of these uh, pictures in the middle F um, that is, those are the low molecular things that were passed very quickly into the hindgut or the midgut rather uh, to be excreted and detoxified again very quickly. So again, you can see that and the researchers here say that uh, this is an expected reason for why they are so good at defeating plant toxins. One of the reasons is that they uh, are able to get rid of the really uh, noxious stuff very easily. People ask me all the time about spider mite feces and other other pest uh, matter like that. And if it's a real big problem, is it concerning? What about predatory mites? Don't they do the same thing? Um, yes, yes, this is a really important thing to consider. So I've put it here in this slide. Um, basically, on the left here, this bright field uh, display shows a digestive cell as it develops over time and as it as it basically generates and collects more uh, substances. It gets darker and darker. And in spider mites and also other, other arachnids and some insects, the end of the metabolism of nitrogenous compounds is actually guanine. You know, guanine, the thing that you get in your energy drinks. <laughs> and uh, it's uh, oftentimes the case that they produce um, crystals. They produce crystalline guanine 
what are called bifringent spherules, uh, and also some chlorophyll and chlorophyll byproducts usually. So they don't pass like a, a, a toxic compound or a um, sort of like a pathogen or something that you have to worry about in that sense. Like, do you want them on your plants? Is it lower quality? Absolutely, of course. But if you were worried about like medically, if there's a danger there, um, there is not actually such a danger. And oftentimes these crystals, uh, they kind of just sort of, um, they're just leached off and they uh, evaporate or they fall off. They're not very um, persistent. And then a little bit, if you want to check out my video on YouTube, I have a video called The Role of Insect Digestion and in Integrated Pest Management, if you want to learn more about this. But basically, uh, these organisms do have the ability to break down things like plant cell walls, sometimes also other things like uh, various toxins, and they use various enzymes to do so. And I have these sort of highlighted like uh, beta-glucanases, xylanases, and pectinases, although this is for insects in particular. Mite physiology is uh, slightly different in this diagram. Um, it's generally true. They have a foregut and midgut and hindgut, but it is definitely different. For example, they don't have something called a paratrophic matrix. And um, I do have this here. I'm going to see if this works here. This is uh, Some people have made statements uh, that this is not actually the case. And for those who are uh, familiar uh, or not familiar, here's what some of those are in case you were curious. Plant feeding insects don't have a pancreas. They can't digest sugar. Or insects do not have very good digestive systems. Stuff has to come in digested to them because they cannot digest things. They just don't have the enzyme. So you've got these insects that are keying in on very specific uh, plants or even, let's say, the fruiting structures like a tomato, and that's what they are, they are uh, they're keying in on. Insects are only tuned in to the unhealthy plant. No insect will ever attack a healthy plant. So what they're zooming in on is the unhealthy plant because it's digestible. Uh, healthy plants are not digestible. Unhealthy plants are. So because they can't digest a healthy plant, there, there's, there's no interest in even attacking it. So there's some contention to this, certainly. Uh, it's somewhat true that toxins and things like this can have a negative response to their host, but it doesn't necessarily mean that an organism isn't going to feed on it. And I think this is a really common thing that people don't always sort of understand. And um, even the literature on it can be a little bit confusing. But indeed, these spider mites, if you haven't been convinced already, definitely have the ability to do the things that we're talking about. So how do you treat them? So there's a lot of treatments for them. Um, such a prolific organism does have many predators. We have made use of many of them in agriculture. One of them is the persimilis mite, Phytostilius persimilis, which is a specialist land hunter. It's adapted to defeat spider mites and especially their web defenses, which makes them very good at what they do. In my opinion, they're really great because the females will often go after the eggs because the eggs don't move around and they don't represent a really taxing source for nutrients. In fact, as eggs, they probably have many of the nutrients that they need for their own oogenesis or egg production. You've also got things like the Californicus mite, Neostelius californicus. It's also a selective or specialized um, hunter of spider mites, but they also could feed on pollen, which makes them really great if you have some sort of a banker system or if you're able to uh, buy pollen and apply it to maintain a population, even when there aren't any pests for them to feed on, which is incredibly versatile. You also have the spider mite lady beetle, Stethoris punctillum, which is a land hunter as larvae, like other lady beetles that feed on, for example, aphids. But as flyers, they're very robust beetles, and they can also feed and oviposit near mites. You've also got the spider mite midge, Fel uh, Feltiella acarasuga, which I have a video about on my YouTube channel for more info. They don't get a lot of representation in my experience, but the larvae and research have shown to have a very high kill count, uh, even higher than the mites that I just mentioned. And their adult form allows them to disperse and oviposit in various places. But they are kind of dainty. They are a midge. So um, care has to be taken when utilizing them, I think, especially in a cannabis um, context, especially an indoor facility or where there's a lot of wind. And then there's the Buveria bastiana fungus that I'm such a big fan of. 
It's an arthropod pathogen, and it's got a very broad host range, which can include spider mites, but I wouldn't really call it a hard counter to spider mites. It might be a really good thing to use in your disruptive regimen. You've also got various chemical controls like wettable sulfur. It's uh, toxic to the spider mites. I've said before that it kind of burns the exoskeleton and burns the body in a chemical reaction, and that's true, but there's also a toxic component as well. Um, now, interestingly enough, in spider mite research about sulfur, it's found that uh, they can actually hurt the eggs and the adults, which not, which not all uh, like botanical toxins can do. And temperature and humidity increases also increase lethality. So that was kind of interesting, and you can read about that more in the color-coded research reports. I've also used azadiractin before, which has been effective in my, uh, in my experience. Uh, but coverage is very important, again, for efficacy. If they have all that spider webbing going on, um, that can make it very difficult to penetrate through. So you have to kind of uh, disrupt that if you're trying to use this sort of compound or other compounds that are contact killers. And then there's an interesting research report that came out in 2021 looking at erythritol, which is an um, artificial sweetener. And it had uh, anti-xenotic and antibiotic, which are severely, you know, sort of negative effects on spider mice. At um, 30%, I think, was the amount that they were using in a solution. And it had minimal sublethal effects on predatory mites even. So it was actually tested to be used in concert, which was pretty cool. I also want to go a little bit over specifically on persimilis because they're what I often recommend people utilize. Um, just a little bit of a brief, they're a type 1A predatory mite, which means that they only feed on spider mites. They're specialized on spider mites specifically, they don't feed on pollen, and they pretty much don't feed on any other sort of mite. Um, so you can't really count on them for anything else but spider mites. They don't have simple eyes even for their prey, but uh, the spider mite actually does have eyes, which is kind of funny. So persimilis and other predatory mites do not. And so they mostly are able to make their way through chemoreceptive and tactile senses. Usually you've seen spider mites if you, or uh, predatory mites moving their front two legs around to sort of cast about and detect their, their prey, and that's what they're doing. And persimilis mites are able to sort of traverse and pierce the silk that spider mites produce, which again, makes them very effective. Maybe you apply a knockdown first, like one of the compounds I mentioned, and then you follow that up with something like a predatory mite, like a persimilis mite, and that would be very effective, and it's a pretty common tactic. And it's also helpful to know if you're looking microscopically and you see a bunch of eggs, well, if you see some of those eggs are white and clear colored and cream colored, those are probably spider mites. But if you see them turn like sort of an orangish, reddish color, then that's probably a persimilis mite egg that has been laid by a female persimilis uh, during its rampage. And uh, I have this video here. You can't hear the video. It's just some, some music, basically. But if you've never seen a persimilis mite, uh, this is kind of what they look like. They've got these spindly legs. And as you can see, you can even see their chelicera, which are kind of like fangs, um, sort of at their forefront. And they're moving along. And they move their front two legs in order for them to sort of uh, detect their surroundings, as you can see. So that's what they look like kind of under a microscope. And if you've ever, if you've never seen them go after a spider mite, this is a persimilis mite feeding on a spider mite adult. This is actually somewhat sped up, believe it or not. Um, but you can see that they've sort of grasped the body and they've just put their mouth into the body. And if you see this little thing moving along the screen, that's actually a broad mite. Uh, I was taking this video when I was working with some Gerbera flowers and they were dealing with broad mite at the same time. So that's a little broad mite moving around. As you can see, very different in size uh, between a broad mite and even a spider mite or a phytoceid mite. So if you've ever wondered what that size difference is, that's a really good example. Um, this is just another graphical example of why persimilis mites go after eggs so well. And over here, I've put out that, um, I've highlighted this research report that adult and nymphal prey are assumed to be equivalent to five to seven or two to three eggs uh, per, per organism, per individual. 
reproduction to occur only after the mite has consumed enough prey to cover its metabolic costs. Again, females have to produce the nutrients or, or aggregate the nutrients in order to produce eggs. About five spider mite eggs a day, or yeah, about five spider mite eggs are enough for one egg per day, I believe is how this is uh, metered out. I might not be right on that particular quote. Um, but persimilis adults are assumed to reproduce throughout their lifetime of about 36 days. So it even lasts a little bit longer than spider mite adults do under ideal conditions. And the figure one says that it is assumed that the maximum gut capacity of adults, of adult persimilis, is 45 egg equivalents, and for nymphs, about six egg equivalents. Prey stages are attacked in the following order. So of preference, we have eggs, then larvae, which are the smaller immature stages, then nymphs, which are the middle, age, middle stages, and then the adults, which are the last stage. So as you can see, as the spider mite becomes more difficult to attack, uh, their preference for it wanes. It doesn't mean they won't go after it, but it means that they're going to really kill the uh, beginning stages first, which is actually really good. And this was an example from a research report um, that showed that uh, when you restricted the movement of persimilis mites and spider mites between plants, uh, what were some of the outcomes of that essentially? And at different inoculation rates, we have here 10,000, 1,000, 100 mites per 100 stems. This was not in cannabis specifically, but you can see that when you can't, when you restrict the movement of persimilis, uh, you see that the populations uh, grow quite a bit. Um, so that's basically what that's showing. And that's useful because if you are growing and the plants are touching each other or you have a netting or something like that, then that can work kind of like a highway and allow the persimilis mice to move uh, to other, other plants. There are also microbial biocontrols. So we have, again, Bukhari bassiana that has been shown to be useful. It's also an endophyte, so it can exist inside of plants, which has its own benefits of priming the immune response in various ways. There's also this non-commercial fungus that's pretty common. It probably exists in your environment if you have spider mites called Neozygetes floridana. It's an obligate specialist fungal parasite, which means that it has to parasitize spider mites in order to uh, complete its life cycle. It overwinters or has been found to overwinter in the bodies of spider mites and its relatives. And in fact, male spider mites prefer to mate with infected female bodies uh, after they've died, in fact. And that's a theme that you'll see in a lot of um, entomopathogenic fungi, believe it or not. There are also bacteria. Now, funny enough, two-spotted spider mites have this great immune system against chemical toxins and have even taken some genes from other bacteria, well, before they were even mites, I suppose. But they're highly challenged by both positive and negative strain uh, bacteria or gram bacteria. And uh, even ones that are not really parasites, they can really damage the body. And the reasoning given here is that apparently, unlike, for example, or similar to like aphids, the aseptic nature of their feeding source, so like the cells, uh, is supported by a rough comparative characterization of the gut bacteria present in, in this case, the two mite species that they studied in the report. So essentially, because cell contents specifically don't tend to have a lot of microbes, maybe there's microbes in on, or on and around it, but not inside of it, uh, their evolution has been relaxed in their responses to bacteria. So we could take advantage of that potentially. There's even viruses that spider mites can uptake they aren't very good at um, transmitting plant viruses, though, apparently, which is sort of surprising when some viruses, some plant viruses are vectored by other insects that have a similar feeding style, and they can simply just get them onto their um, stylet or their mouth part and then move them to another plant. But apparently the two-spot spider mite is not very good at this. And there's there was originally other research in the past, in the 60s and 70s, that seem to make the, the case that spider mites were able to be very robust transmitters, but that research has never been um, replicated. So in my opinion, I don't think that's actually the case. I think there might have been a contamination issue or something like that. And that seems to be the opinion of other researchers too. So just be careful with the research that you take a look at. Uh, try to be more comprehensive. I've put the research that I was talking about here for you to take a look at. 
And there's also viruses that spider mites can get that affect themselves. Um, and here we've got uh, a Keda virus, a Distra virus, and a Me virus. And you have an example of what a uh, dist uh, Distra virus can look like like this one called the Israeli acute bee paralysis virus, which is actually a pretty big problem for pollinators. Um, it'll get onto the pollen, onto the flowers, and then it'll move from honeybees to other pollinators, and that's not very good. And those pollinators get killed in the process. And these are all various places where sp two spot spider mites have been taken as samples and then evaluated for their resistance to uh, really noxious acaricides and Again, this is just more evidence of some of the really terrible things that have been used against them that keeps that has not affected them, like carbamates, pyrethroids, even avermectins, biphenazate. Um, these are just really noxious compounds and not something you should use in cannabis. And in fact, this is just another good example for why you shouldn't use them because they won't even work. At least a lot of the time. People also ask me a lot about attraction and repellence with plant volatiles. Um, there are these things called herbivore-induced plant volatiles, and they can have effects on the perception of an organism of its surroundings. But sometimes that perception can change, even if in research reports we evaluate a population that responds one way. In nature, they might have learned to evaluate those responses differently. But for Tetranagus urticae, we know that alpha-osamine, alpha-farnesine, pinene, D-limonene, diacetone alcohol, uh, they all have a repellent effect, or they have been found to have a repellent effect in sour oranges. Um, they were found to be attracted to compounds like diethylene glycol butyl ether, uh, benz uh, yeah, benzyl dehyde, and methyl salicylate, which is pretty interesting because methyl salicylate is a really common compound found in a lot of plants and is often used in signaling. Uh, beta osamine, DMNT, which is not what you think, TM, TMTT, not TMNT, and linalool uh, are elevated in lima bean plants colonized by a fungus, uh, a mycorrhizal fungus, compared to those that weren't colonized by that fungus and seem to attract persimilis mites, interestingly. And then these compounds called acyl sugars, which are precursors and often used as um, uh, toxins of other arthropods, but they're precursors of other flavonoids like norangenin, hesperitin, and p cumeric acid are associated with resistance in the citrus plants. Uh, thymol and carvacrol are potent acaricidal agents found in plants, and the sesquiterpene uh, 7 epizinga bearing has been found to interfere with their reproduction. So there are compounds out there that breeders and other cultivators might be able to exploit either by uh, breeding plants that produce quite a bit of it for even our own enjoyment and benefit, but also for negatively affecting spider mites and other um, arthropods. And then I just wanted to finish off with a little bit of a review that um, multispectral imaging and using drones, especially in field ops, maybe not so relevant to the home grower, but in field conditions have been used to great effect with machine learning to be able to find damaged plants. And in fact, I read many research reports, not so much for spider mites, but also for pathogens that even before their visual symptoms, they were able to find plants that were reflecting a sort of a different uh, spectrum of light when the light hits their mostly water body. And that has been used to great effect and with great accuracy when we test. So this might be an option for some people in the future for testing for spider mites. And I would keep my eye on it if you're in that context. And that's it. You are still And I muted. swore, and I swore I hit the button too. I, okay. It's another one of those. No, uh, thank you very much for that, Zeth and all. I do appreciate that. And everybody in chat, if you guys have some questions, definitely start getting them in there. Um, I do write them down kind of as we go along. And we just had one from EJ Fire. And it's actually not too far back. I could put that up here. Let me, let me go to the magic machine that we call StreamYard. All right. So EJ Fire would want to know... 
What is a good banker plant for spider mites? Do they mean? I hope they mean predatory mites. Because pretty much any plant is a good baker plant for spider mites. They love all kinds of plants. <laughs> They'll take like, everything. <laughs> you don't have to be very specific. Beans, beans are great. Cucumber, they do really good on cucumber. Um, I guess they just, and especially we're talking about like domesticated plants, right? Um, well, is there something, have, yeah, is there something that they would walk by or they're just like, hey, check out this neighborhood and just go to town? <laughs> I've seen research that they do uh, poorer and also thrips are this way. Um, on like on like uh, pepper plants and things like that. So I guess they've got a, a couple of more uh, toxins that might give them a bit more like heartburn or indigestion or something like that. Um, but they're still able to eke out a pretty good existence. Um, for predators of spider mites and things like that, um, the issue is that a lot of the specialists will just feed on the on the mites. So the plants that you attract, I think, are going to be you know it's sort of nebulous. I don't think there's a lot of hard solid data that I could really base something on there. So, oh, and I'm glad I appreciate that, Laura. Um, I put a lot of effort in this particular presentation because I found it so fascinating. So thank you very much for that. And another one that came in while we're uh, listening to, and you had mentioned that spider mites, you know, they're making the nest kind of at the top. They cast their silk and they go to the top because they're trying to catch wind so that they can move on. Mm -hmm. um, is the, and the question was, uh, do spider mites not like wind, like a heavy and constant wind? Is that something that would actually detour them from populating a particular area of the grow room, like right in front of the fan or something? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, from what I can tell, and you can look up the research that I cited, um, it seems like it's the opposite. They actually would be, they need to use that wind. They perceive that wind and they put up their, their front legs um, hmm. to kind of like catch that wind as it like sort of um, tumultuously moves apparently um, underneath leaves and things and up and will carry them up out onto okay. hopefully a, a close by plant and that kind of a thing. So this is also true for russet mites too. When they, what we call quest, they quest for uh, wind and they put up their legs and I guess this is a common thing that they do. Okay. And and here's one too that kind of struck my curiosity because you talked about a lot of just like really harsh chemicals that they could really care less about. They seem not very detoured by it, but you just mentioned peppered and in my mind I'm like, well, you know, it's an essential oil. It could be, you know, the capsaicin or whatever in there. That might be interesting. Uh, and then kind of the question that followed uh, from Paul B is would a fermented pepper spray slow them down? Maybe. I've definitely seen um, capsaicin, now that, now that you've mentioned that, actually, I've seen some capsaicin products that have been used just like just capsaicin and maybe like garlic, I think also like a garlic oil. Um, and they were used against spider mites to, I guess it's like agitates them, it would sure okay. agitate me. And uh, <laughs> it makes them like kind of move and become and get out of their like hidey holes. And then you might okay. combine that or uh, subsequently use a different compound and sort of uh, annihilate them that way. So like smoke them know. out first. Yeah, I don't know how effective it is as a toxin, um, something that will kill them that way. But that's a good point. I'm glad somebody asked that. Fermented pepper, though, I'm not totally sure. Yeah, because that, you know, I, I heard fermented and that my brain instantly goes to like the, the KNF, Jadam type growing, oh, which sure. I'm just learning. But yeah, you, that, that's interesting, though, because again, there's nasty chemicals that they don't like and peppers. We could eat it for dinner and almost yeah. make something with it, too. Uh, and, and I don't know much about St. John's wort myself. Um, and I don't really know what the mode of action would be. Have you ever seen this uh, discussed as an option for control with spider mites? I sort of vaguely think that I've encountered that, but I, I just don't really know if they would be negatively affected by that. They could be, potentially. Um, and also, I think it's, it's helpful to note that, like, also with, like, the fermented pepper um, concept, like if you sometimes you don't have to like kill them outright, but if you're able to like spray them and disrupt them in that sort of a way, like you might kill them through physical means rather than uh, sort of toxic means, if that makes sense, especially if you're able to catch them early on, 
and you don't have like a massive colonization. If that makes sense. Yes, and the crop scouting helps prevent that. And and here's a question: it, you know, it could apply to spider mites, but I think it's all just general questions itself. And it's interesting being the audio engineer that I am. Um, but just kind of, are there any studies on sound frequencies as a deterrent to pests? Seems to be working as a human deterrent. Which, yeah, I mean, if you're talking high frequencies, sometimes even really low frequencies. Uh, yeah, that's an interesting question. So a lot of uh, a lot of ins mites don't have ears, or even an organ that works like an ear. Uh, some insects do, but not all insects do. Um, so it'd be vibrational ask, then. Well, yeah. So like, what well, like, well, so sonication uh, can have I think has its place for other things potentially. There's some really interesting research that I'm cautiously optimistic about. In fact, I think I use that exact terminology on the Chief Homebrew podcast uh, on Sunday. Uh, but basically, I think that there is a, a, I think there's a validity to using, especially mechano stimulation. So like vibrations, like you were saying, like if you uh, potentially from not necessarily priming the plant immune system, although there seems to be some effects there, but like just from like disrupting their ability to feed or like shaking them off the plant, like physically, like that might be able to go a long way. But for sonication, I'm not so sure. Okay. And, um, Here's kind of another question as well. Uh, Bavaria bassiana. That that was effective for spider mites or part of the program? Yeah. So, okay. and in fact, there are some strains, some commercial strains that are used that are supposedly like specific for uh, spider mites. So you might want to seek those ones out. Um, you okay. know, the, the marketing is there if you want to Google it. Um, and then maybe try those out first if you want to apply that. I have I have pictures myself of um, that I've taken when we've applied Bouveria in cut flowers, and you get this micro-sized mite afterwards, and I've definitely experienced it myself. Okay. Humidity plays a large role with that, though. Okay, cool. Yeah, that was uh, the second part there because, yeah, sometimes outdoors, you know, you kind of have to take what you get as far as humidity and temperature goes. So good question there. Uh, let's see here. I'll keep looking, but I, I've got some banked over here. Um, okay, so the eggs and the adults, or eggs to adults, is about eight days. Um, do the eggs leave any sign of like an exoskeleton or traces that they were there? Some remnant? Yeah, uh, so they do produce sort of uh, like the exoskeleton or the exuvium, uh, like insects do. Um, and eggs can like there's like a chorion like in like a chicken egg you know that like they pierce out of and then like kind of leave behind that desiccates but actually now that you've mentioned it when i look at spider mites microscopically i haven't done that a lot you know, like in a significant way in a little while um i feel like a lot of those don't hang around at the same capacity as like with like aphids for example i'm not really sure why that is it could just be observational bias in my part but um, the biggest thing that you would see would be the webbing, more or less. That, that would be your real sign uh, that would be left behind. Okay. And here's, here's just an interesting comment on, on the last question, too, from Gorski's. The hair on the body picks up the frequencies, maybe. Yeah, I mean, all, all frequencies are sound pressure waves. And that, you know, probably would be picked up by something like that. Um, but again, that's that's an interesting field because I do believe uh, in Eastern Washington uh, orchards use some sort of sonic frequencies to detour birds from the uh, orchards. So that that's one application, but that is a much larger <laughs> being than little little mite. So, well, on that note, uh, sometimes the non-glandular trichomes on plants can like mm. you know like there's been some interesting studies where sonication. Like maybe there's a perception of sound that isn't just like vibra vib vibratory through the tissue, but also like in the air. And a so resonating some interesting stuff there. Yeah, exactly. Resonating frequency. Resonance. Yeah, if it, yes. if it hits that magic spot, and like anybody can understand that if you're like humming or singing in the shower, and all of a sudden it gets like three times louder, you just hit the resonating frequency for the area you're yes. in. That's the explanation there. Um, Okay, and then speaking of the eggs and trichomes, too, you showed a picture of their eggs earlier, and I was like, geez, that sure looks like a trichome to me. Yeah. Um, 
And they even kind of change color, you said, from like a clear to a milky to, to an amber. Yes. So do trichomes. Would right. it be possible for somebody to be like, man, my, my leaves are getting super frosty. This is going to be great. But they really have uh, eggs. Do, are eggs on the top of the leaf or the bottom side of the leaf? That's a great question uh, both ways. So I've seen spider mice on the tops and on the bottoms, but they do tend to like to be on the bottom of leaves in my experience. I think that's like a defense mechanism against like ultraviolet light, which is not great for them. Right. Um, and uh, I have definitely experienced in a professional and also a non-professional experience with many people that have thought that the spider mite eggs that they were looking at were just, um, well, actually it's the opposite. Usually they come across where they, they're, they're overreacting to gl resin glands thinking that they're spider mite eggs. That's actually mm -hmm. more common, at least from my experience, uh, which is kind of endearing because it means that they're worried about the prevention, which is good. Mm -hmm but then they end up doing things like uh, getting rid of their plants or um, something like that, which is um, unfortunate. Yeah, that, that would be horrible too, because there's really, there's three kinds of trichomes that I'm aware of. There's the capitate stock one, which is the one we see in pictures that makes it Instagram worthy. There's the sessile ones, which basically still have the bulbous head, but there's really no stock to it, which I could see being confused for the uh, eggs. And then there's another one, but uh, it's no fun, so I forget its name. Uh, let's see here. Uh, let's see. Question might have been asked, but UV light, you just touched on UV light a little bit, but yay or I nay? On that. Yeah, so um, there is research. I, I had to stop somewhere or else the presentation was going to be too long. Um, and uh, there is some research that shows that uh, UVB light and UVC light, which are the more potent spectra of ultraviolet, um, is negatively affecting spider mites. Um, and so they don't like that. That's why they have to be on the other side of the leaves and it can hurt them. And, but like using it as a treatment, I think is a little bit difficult because you have to not hurt your plant as well. And you might mm -hmm. have other reasons for not exposing your plant to high amounts of ultraviolet radiation. Also uh, other biocontrols you might have, fungi, bacteria, are also going to be negatively affected too if you're not mm. careful that's a very good point a lot of people in the you know living soil systems uh yeah you don't want to to kind of almost go the nuclear option there i don't know if that phrase is out of passe or whatever now but hey oh. <laughs> so it's kind of kind of sticking with the light thing though uh squishy mirror brings us up and, and you had mentioned earlier that the 700 nanometer range is not attractive to them but repellent. or a repel yeah so a repellent which is great was there a particular level of par or you know u moles that you needed to hit is it just any 700 nanometer yeah, heavy dose great, i'm really happy you brought that up because that was a point that i forgot to mention that i had in my head but not on the presentation and if you look up the research report um if you go back and you look at that slide there's a research report where i'm where I delved that, where I uh, drew that information from. And you have to understand this about insect and mite eyes, which is that they're not like ours. And intensity of light is a really important factor for them perceiving light and even perceiving colors of light, uh, so as we would call them colors. Um, so like the yellow light that I was talking about for them to achieve the effect of like mm -hmm. low egg laying, for example, they had to have over like 50 kilowatt hours per meter squared or something like that. I forget the exact um, Excessive, the exact though. intensity, but yeah, like you might, like it might be like you devote like an actual, like a, like a light source, like this only doing like yellow light, if that makes sense. Okay. Okay. And then again, we'd have to figure out how that ties in with the plant physiology, how the plant likes it, but interesting approach. And then um, I guess his kind of question, what about light? So it was 700 nanometers is a repellent um and then yeah your attraction is to a certain wavelength um and do we know why i know you might have touched this but is it a pheromone uh disruptor or is there a particular mechanism we know why this works i don't think that the i was looking at the research report and i don't think that they had a reason um they did bring up and in fact actually another thing that i was trying to find out was um what the exact 
So like there were two studies on that slide. One of them showed the nanometers that they had, which was great. The other one did not. It just said yellow, blue, neon. And I was like, okay, well, that doesn't tell me. I would like to have more details. But they did tell it. They did show the the device that they used. So you might be able to figure it out from that. But um, to answer that question, I would imagine that it's probably to do with overwintering or maybe a perception in the changing of seasons. That's usually what is the case with a lot of organisms where their light perception changes their behavior. So that could okay. be it, but I don't know. Okay. That's a, a, a good hypothesis, logical there. Uh, can look into that. And again, that's kind of one of the beauties about having the presentation and being able to go back to it uh, is you have a lot of the source material there. Uh, and, you know, it's good to be able to read up on things too. And a lot of times things are Google Googleable. I'm sure that's a word. I'll Google that. Um, uh, but yeah, uh, that's a great way to find things. And we're, we're talking, kind of speaking of finding things, uh, I, pest identification is always a tough one. And early on, you had a slide where it showed like the whole rainbow, basically, of two spotted spider mites. Uh, the identification was a little hard. There's some bugs that aren't them that also look like them. So that's kind of a nightmare for people. Uh, be sure in your identification. But what is going to be the best tool or method to like photograph them? Because they're small. Are they fast as well? Do they you know zig and zag, or do they just steady line walk? They can they can zig and zag a little bit, but they usually kind of move. They can move a little bit quickly if you're trying to like use like a microscope, like uh, an observational microscope at like 40X or even something like that. Um, but I find that a hand lens is just fine enough in the field condition. Um, knowing whether it's exactly the two spot spider mite or one of its many brethren is sort of like maybe not the biggest problem because the treatments and the physiology are going to be pretty similar. So. Okay. In the event that you maybe have, I don't know, Tichonychus trickstani or Tichonychus kanzawi or something else, um, you know, maybe it is going to be pretty much identical in how you treat it, especially with the biocontrols. Okay. I absolutely love this next question. Um, it's kind of one of those just like, huhs, things that make you go, hmm, I love, oh, wrong one. No, wrong one. Okay, this one. I love it. So, I have a totally unrelated and somewhat silly question for Matthew. Do insects sleep? I'd like yeah. to know too. Thank you, yeah, Georgia that, Grow Guy. A, that's a great question. Um, they, they do have they have something called torpor, which is um, not just for vampire lords anymore. It's just when <laughs> you know it's like they go into like a reduced uh, state of like activity. It's like hibernation, but I guess all the animal behaviorologists decided that they would have their own specific word for different kinds of the same thing. So you've got hibernation and diapause and torpor and all this stuff. Uh, but yeah, they do have like a reduced kind of like how, you know, dolphins, I don't, maybe this is apocryphal, but you know, dolphins, like their brain are still active when they're sleeping, when they're sleeping kind of when they're, you know, so it's kind of like that where they okay. could, they could quickly rise out of that, um, if they have like a stimulus like temperature increase or something interesting too and then squishy mirror i'm not sure if that's the same but like hummingbirds they i still marvel at how they don't freeze in the winter but yes and uh laura yes right on thanks for joining us we're watching these all week i rewatch these myself i actually because it's nice i can go to the back end i download them for myself so i've got them on the hard drive <laughs> oh sure let's see here um Beneficials. You said Persimilis is a specialist to the spider mite. That was your go-to. Um, and does that actually go after the eggs as well? Yeah, it prefers okay. the eggs. Okay. Oh, prefers the eggs. Okay, so is it good on the adults? Is it the all-around full full meal deal, or it is? It, okay. So, like in in uh, in previous. Uh, presentations. I've talked about how sometimes a predatory mite like Cucumerus or something will maybe mostly go after the eggs or mostly go after like the first stages and leave the last stages. And that's an important contention. But uh, the two spot spider mite, Persimilis, can feed on all the life stages. 
uh, they just go after the eggs more, you know, for a bunch of reasons. Like, they can't see, right? They're blind, so it's not like they're that selective in that way. But um, it seems like they will, um, like, if they detect an egg, then they'll just feed on that egg, and they don't have to worry about, like, you know, bearing it down <laughs> and, like, you know, struggling with a with an adult, for example. But they right. will feed on the adults, too. I don't, I really don't want to make the impression that they will not go after them or they won't go after them very well. They will. Um, but uh, it's really a matter of, like, statistics of them encountering them. Okay. And here's a good one. Let me just flip the screen here real quick. Um, coming in from Tao, the American one, because I don't think we covered this. Um, but have any insects or spider mites figured out how to build a tolerance to smothering or suffocating type IPMs? Uh, the one that comes to my mind first is, like, neem oil. Um but yeah, no, great question. Yeah, so they don't, um, they don't have the layer of resistance to that. So suffocants will be effective in that way, uh, in the same way that they're effective to other arthropods that have to, uh, you know, they have to breathe or other organisms rather. So that's a really good point to make. You can use uh, those as well. Okay. Okay. Good call there. And let's see here. Yeah, I'm just kind of looking at my notes. You know, they, they multiply real quick, which, you know, again, you tell one friend and they tell five friends and then they tell five friends and then you have 50 and then you have 100 and then you have 500. Um, don't let That's things get out of control. Too. I know. Crazy <laughs> little buggers. Uh, where where are you going to typically see them first, though? Is it going to be uh, something that you're seeing crawling in the soil? Do they congregate like on the base of the stalk or do they just treat it equally and then only congregate at the top when it's too populated and they're trying to disperse elsewhere. Yeah. It's kind of like what you described, Chad. So okay. like, it's like, um, I mean, if, if we just assume that like a spider mite female just appears on like a leaf, um, then she might like just focus on, I mean, she's just going to make eggs and then she's going to, uh, produce offspring and then, they'll produce more offspring and it usually kind of like radiates out from there. Okay. So, so like maybe they'll be on a leaf and then that leaf gets kind of reasonably po uh, populated and they don't tend to like, I mean, the, there might be some exploratory individuals, right? But by and large, it kind of just radiates out. And then if it gets really colonized in general, then they'll start to like aggregate to the top, if that makes sense. Okay. Okay, so again, it's it's really the underside of the leaves is the magic as far as scouting goes. Yeah, and you can see their damage of the cells that they've sucked out on the tops of leaves too. So it can be pretty simple to just uh, flip the leaf over and you can see the little mites and their bodies filled with that chlorophyll that they've digested, which are the two okay. spots that we're talking about. Two spots spider mite. Uh, the two spots are the cica, their intestinal cavities. And when they're full, there's spots. When they're not full, there's no spots. So that's what that is. Okay. And, and here's, um, let's see, it's a product that I know we've talked about or been mentioned before. And it's kind of escaping me what the mode of action. Oh, let me get rid of uh, <laughs> a... Uh, the the nudie the nudie links have found us oh my goodness okay got that taken care of uh, let's see oh yeah so it's it's a product that we've kind of mentioned before and I wasn't sure what the mode of action on it is uh, but it says do you have any experience with marone bio uh, or you know in that case the mode of action that it employs to do its magic yeah um, we've talked about it even in a few other uh, presentations so you can check those out too. But basically, a lot of, not all, but some of those uh, products are what we call biorational. And so what they do is they prime the immune response of a plant, sort of generally. Okay. Um, usually this is through the exposure of the plant to uh, compounds that it associates with danger, essentially, or damage or something like this, some sort of a, a problem, potentially. And even biological organisms that are mutualists, like mycorrhizal fungi, can still elicit this response because they're still like a foreign body, if that makes sense. Kind of like how if you cut yourself and there's like a, 
a splinter in your body, it reacts to the splinter because right. it's foreign. It's like that kind of a thing. Okay. And, and, you know, again, we had mentioned some of the, the harsh chemicals that have been tested around the world on these um, that don't work. Um, and pyrethrin was one of them. But spinosad is another one that you hear a lot in the kind of the organic community because it is an organic compound. Uh, it's also on the banned chemicals list in Oregon for cannabis production, but it's not in many other states. So is spinosad something that's been looked at against the two-spotted spider mite? You know, off the top of my head, I actually can't remember, which is very embarrassing because I think I think that it actually does work against it, I want to say, but I'm not totally sure. I might be wrong. Um, the spinosins that make up spinosad are from a, a bacterial source. So if okay. people are curious, you know, spinosad, that sounds kind of weird. Um, that's where that comes from. And the, and why it is banned in some places and not others, I wouldn't be able to tell you. I don't think that's a, um, I don't think there's a scientific reason. It might be a legal or legislative reason. Oregon is, uh, the OMMP is very uh, overprotective of the consumer, which I'm kind of in the favor of, uh, but that very well likely could be the case. I don't, I don't know their uh, reasoning behind it, but that's something that's easily looked up if anybody wants to, to check into that. Um, and let's see here, ladybugs. That, that's one that, that commonly comes up and usually it's, it's more of like, oh, that's cute versus like, yeah, they're really effective. Um, <laughs> but you've actually mentioned ladybugs do work on this. Now, does it have to be a specialized one? Because you mentioned the spider mite lady beetle, uh, actually. So the cute little red and black dots work, or we need a specialist here? You do need the specialist. The other okay. ones mainly go after aphids. Um, but this Dothorus punctillum is the spider mite lady beetle. Uh, and they go after spider mites specifically. And there's other lady beetles that are specialized. One that feeds on powdery mildew. Uh, one that feeds on um, white flies, for example, Delphastis. So there are these other specialists. But generally, lady beetles, you want to, if you are going to use them at all, which I'm not a huge fan of, you might want, you're going to want to use them against aphids primarily. The okay. ones that are commercially available. Okay. And yeah, actually, I'm glad Space Coyote 82 is reading my mind. That's what I just spaced out on. But you brought my stoner moment back for me. Thank you. The the Spinosad, uh, I always call it Spinosad because I never heard it pronounced before I read it and had to pronounce it. So I went with my like phonetic way. Um, it's in uh, flea medication. And that was my, my vet gave it to me. And I've got, you know, big dog, little dog. And it was for the little dog. So I'm always reading the label. And like active ingredient was the spinosad. And I'm like, this this is what I use to kill bugs, man. You want me to give this to the dog? And But that was, uh, there's he told me an interesting backstory. I don't know if it was true or not. But uh, yeah, it seems to be pretty effective for fleas, at least, on dogs. Don't know if it's good for cats. Don't confuse the two people. Can be bad animal lover okay um i actually think spinosad is a better pronunciation personally okay yay i'll go with it but yeah there's some words uh molly molly beating them uh was oh, another uh, one of those words yeah, I, I always call it yeah one. molly be denim that's what i call it because <laughs> again i had to read it in books a whole bunch before i ever heard somebody say the word uh too much information here is a freaking excellent question though uh squishy mirror coming with the heat today um legitimate concern by using these recommended products as a community do we risk developing immunity within the industry if so how can this be prevented freaking marvelous yes this is the best question so far um, it's no great. offense to anyone else, but this is like something that I uh, am very passionate about talking about. So it's the best question to me. Yeah, the answer is yes. The answer is yes. Uh, botanical insecticides, toxins, um, even things that we consider to be organic or common that they interact with or whatever, like all of those things could, I mean, for one thing, they're already exposed to it. So they probably already have some resistance elements that are selecting or being selected for in the population not just spider mites but tons of other things as a community if we want to be most effective it's very important that we observe resistance mediation techniques uh, so in integrated pest management this would be um, something like 
rotating using different compounds so you don't select for the same or the same mode of action. So understanding what the compound is, whether it's, uh, you know, an organic compound or something else, like how does it work? Why does it work? And also something that a lot of people associate with other chemistries is something like cross resistance. So like with a lot of the synthetic pesticides, even though they are totally different classes, what they attack uh, or just by the dint of their just coincidentally, like they can have they, resistance to one can confer resistance to the other. So that's just something that you have to be aware of using biocontrol so that you can eat the ones that survive, you know, um, and have that sort of effect is uh, some of the ways that you can limit that. The other big one is to just not use it unless you absolutely need to use them and not relying on them heavily. That's my opinion. And also the opinion of many specialists. Okay. Yeah. No, great question. And <laughs> crack babies feels me. Molly wearing jeans. Yes. Molly be denim. That's how I remembered it. <laughs> Love it. No, excellent. Good answer too. Cause again, we always, you know, everybody will talk when they're serious about IPM about different modes of action. We don't want to build a resistance to it, but <laughs> if the entire industry is using the same three modes of action, well, everything is going to get familiar with those three uh, things. So, wow. Great question. Um, and, and I guess with that too, if anybody else out there in chat time for last minute questions, we're kind of at the end right now, but I think we can maybe twist his arm if you guys have one or two more to sneak in. Um, Definitely. Yeah. In, in, in the meantime though, if you can, please let everybody know. And these are down in the show notes as well too. Uh, but please let everybody know where they can find you, where they can find more information and kind of uh, what you're working on and what's coming up. Yeah, absolutely. So for professional inquiries, you can contact me at xenthanol.com. And if you're interested in getting some uh, help in a home growth situation or, or just some like general advice, I have a Patreon account. I have a Discord channel. And on that Discord channel, you can access it through my Patreon for as little as $1 a month, which I think is a really great uh, way for me to be able to subsidize some of the free content that I create and also, um, you know, link up with people who just genuinely need this this information kind of quickly. Just like a quick, you know, question. I get questions all the time like, you know, should I use this Orias or should I spray first and then use biocontrols or I've never used biocontrols. How do I use them? And it's very important to me that people are able to get that uh, information, um, even if they're not able to, like, you know, hire a professional specialist for several hundred dollars or something like that, you know, um, especially at the home grow level. I'm all about that grassroots support. And like that question earlier about how we can help people out, part of the way that we can do that is by giving people basic information, like how to identify things and that sort of a thing. You can get a lot of that information actually on my YouTube channel, Xenthanol, and also on my Instagram, and sometimes on my Twitter, which is at SyncAngel, S-Y-N-C-H, like synchronize, A-N-G-E-L. And that is where I do a lot of my content creation, and it's where you'll find a lot of my videos and posts about pests and plant health and the integrated pest management therein. Awesome. I'm just flashing those on the bottom there. And then I, I just put up that comment, you know, again, thank you uh, for sharing the valuable information. So just like you're saying, it's, it's, it's definitely valuable, especially uh, at a home grow level. Cause man, you don't, you don't want to deal with these things. And when, once you've been bitten, even if you get rid of them, which is easier said than done, um, you're scarred for at least a few years. You know, you ever have a spider walk across your like body in the night, you're not going back to sleep right away. So <laughs> same principle there. <laughs> you're scarred. Yes. Oh, shoot. Um, let's see. Hypo Road Beetles. <laughs> Canaman Dan is, has unleashed the beasts. Um, let's see here. Let me put it up to the cool bubble. It's easier to read that way. Um, okay. That's a long one. Are you, are you able to see the question there? Uh, yeah, okay. I have un unleashed some hypoaspis hypo and rove beetles into my living soil beds because I have brought in a larger than wanted population through my worm compost. Do you think this is sufficient? 
I'm not sure what our nematodes. Oh, our nematodes necessary. I see. So, um, well, the nematodes won't go after either of those things, really. Um, the rove beetles or the hypoaspis. They will go after things like fungus gnats, though, but so will the hypoaspis and the rove beetles. Um, if there, I mean, many rove beetles and predatory mice are indeed carnivorous and sometimes even omnivorous. So some of them might die uh, if they're just consummate predators and there's no food source. Uh, other, others will maybe uh, subsist and be able to persist in your living soil bed. Um, but uh, it's unclear to me if you're trying to get rid of them or not, actually, from that question. Or maybe he maybe he misspoke here. He's typing in, sorry, larger population of springtails. Oh, go, uh, okay. I see. Yeah, so okay. um, I don't think, I mean, it could be sufficient. The thing is that springtails are really good at reproducing. And they'll feed, they're, they're too big. There are two big things that tell people who want to reduce springtails in their, um, in their environment. And for a living soil bed, this is going to be pretty much anathema to how you cultivate, which is reduce moisture and reduce free organic matter. Why? Because they really like moisture and they feed on tons of organic matter. Hmm. So if they have a, a food source and a good environment, they're going to reproduce really easily. And that's just the nature of it. And then on top of that, they're super ubiquitous organisms. So even if you were to get rid of them with like a compound, like pyrethrin or something, uh, which I don't advocate for, because uh, I feel, find that they're totally fine, then um, they're just, they might easily come back from an, an input that you bring in or um, just from your environment locally. So it's, it's one of the difficult things for like a, a regenerative ag or a living soil system to sort of deal with for a lot of people. Okay. And, and kind of one thing, uh, one advantage about knowing another language is sometimes you could get people to say silly things when they trust you. Oh, you are muted, But sir. I'm going, me? No. Am I? Oh, I didn't hear you for a bit. Maybe oh, they did. That's weird. Okay, maybe they did. Um, I like the green color. Yes, it's, it's very bright. Oh, I think we figured out the problem. It was on my end, not yours. Okay. Well then they probably they probably hear me and that that might be a sign but we'll sneak we'll sneak one more in here. Um But yeah, no, I'm going to go on a ledge uh Nick you're not making me say anything silly here. Uh I'd love a future episode on those words. Can you break that down for me? <laughs> Please. What is that? Hetero heterodera humuli. So I assume that this is something that feeds on Humulus, or probably Humulus ludicrous, the uh, hop plant. Ludicrous. Um, yeah. No. <laughs> okay, it's like, uh, what's that? There's that scene from uh, Parks and Recreation or something. I don't remember where the guy's like, I just call all these flowers like by rapper names or whatever, and he's <laughs> like, oh, those are some great ludicrouses. Growing really well in that bed. <laughs> oh, I will use this in life. <laughs> yes. Golden nugget, folks. Okay, go ahead, take it away. I see we're echoing. Are we signing out or? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I can oh, I didn't that. see the question. Sorry. Oh no worries. Um, I will just uh, give out the. Yeah, I think we're done with questions right now. Um, to THC, answer to your question is yes. Um, we can create superbugs inadvertently by using the same stuff. Um, okay, so today's Tuesday. Tomorrow, Brian and Marco uh, got a pretty awesome show with the uh, Autoflower podcast. I'm looking forward to that. Going to be talking to someone who that's what they do. So that's going to be a fun conversation. Um, later tonight, we've got um, London. I forget which show he has going, but check out London. He's at five. He's in 20 minutes. And uh, let's see. Thursday, of course, Brian and Layton over on the Big Daddy channel. Uh, but Friday or Wednesday. Hey, tomorrow night, I got something coming up too. Uh, Seed Collectors, Volume 5, coming back. Got Seattle Chronic Seeds and Dave's not here. Dave's the man. Cool beans, guys. So we're going to be doing Seed Collectors Volume 5. And then Friday, I have got a special breeder's highlight. Uh, 
Raw Genetics coming to talk about some of their fire gear and the show they got coming up Saturday. So that's what we've got lined up on the FCP 02 this week. One more show Saturday, just waiting on the flyer. It's going to be the debut of a new show that I'm really excited for. Uh, people from the community that you probably know already. So that is what's up. Thank you, chat, for joining us. Uh, everybody again on the replay, thank you for doing that. We're here. Type in the comments. Let us know what you want to see on future episodes, and we'll get to that. So any kind of closing thoughts or statements there, uh, Mr. Zenthanol? No, just to say that I'm glad that people appreciate this information. It's why I make these presentations. I want to reiterate that it is my great passion that people are able to protect their own plants, use the information that exists out there, because there's quite a bit of it, even if it's a little bit mm, esoteric. And I'm honestly humbled and honored that um, you all allow me to have this space in order to do so and to continue to educate people in this way. And I hope that more people take a look at this information, take a look at the sources, do some research, learn your identification, learn your pests, uh, learn your treatments and your prevention strategies so that uh, you do not get plants with pests and you don't give your pests to other people who have their own plants to deal with. And hopefully as a community, we can all lift up in that way. I said, amen, and thank you. I keep talking on mute. But no, thank you for your contribution. And you know, above all, you're building the solid foundation. Uh, that's the most important thing, is build a solid foundation of knowledge and then expand from there. Don't get in over your head. And uh, yeah, Peter's saying, thank you very much, guys. See you in 20. Again, London, I'll be right back here in 20 minutes. Um, stay tuned and catch him. And you know what? Rumor has it he might be dropping in as a guest to Peer Show. Something very cool coming up from London. Be sure to check that out. Uh, but in the meantime, I look forward to the next one. And again, thank you very much. Everybody have a great day. See you later.